Welcome everybody. My name is Mina Jane and I am one of the programming librarians here at the Cary Library. So happy to be here with you for this really interesting program on foraging in your backyard. I cannot wait to hear what Iris has to say. But before we get to that, I just wanted to let you know a couple of things. One is that we have enabled captions on this program. And if you, um, you'll see them scrolling along the bottom of your screen. If you do not want them, you can go to the bottom of your Zoom. It says live transcript and there's a little arrow that if you hit that, it'll um, you can hide the subtitles. And if you would like to keep them, please enjoy. We love being more accessible to um, just everybody who wants to come to our programs. I would like to um, thank the Library Foundation. The Cary Library Foundation supports all of our adult programming, and we could not do things like this without them. So if you donate to the um, Cary Library Foundation, thank you. And um, that we're going to use the chat tonight for questions and answers. So um, please put your, your questions, your comments, and your um, tech issues in the chat. I'll be following that. We will be taking questions after Iris's presentation. So um, I'll be keeping a track of the questions and I'll ask her um, at the end there. So uh, without any further ado, because I, um, we really want to get into this, um, today we're talking about foraging in your backyard, wild and not so wild plants and their uses with Iris Weaver. She is a na nature-based healing guide, herbalist and foraging instructor. She has been foraging since she was a small child and loves cooking with wild plants, making her own herbal medicines and body care products. She teaches classes locally and online and um, I will put her website in the chat for you so that you can find her because I um, absolutely um, excited about this talk because I feel like we're in a place where we want to know what's in our natural surroundings and how can we use it as we get a little bit back to nature. And I think Iris is going to be wonderful in teaching us a lot tonight. So welcome, Iris. Thank you. This is just a great time to be doing this because everything is starting to come up now. And this is the time to get out there and start foraging and start getting to know your plants and start inviting them into your your larder and into your medicine cabinet and all of that so i'm really happy to be here i am thrilled to see i have a couple of friends on here and my oldest brother so i started foraging when i was about 16. a friend and i taught ourselves how to dye wool with plant dyes and that led to other interests in plants to looking for wild foods, otherwise known as weeds. Some of you might remember the book Stalking the Wild Asparagus. That was my introduction to foraging. And then that led to an interest in medicinal plants and in working with plants for crafting and making wreaths and so on and for their energy and their magic and so on. So tonight, we're going to have three parts of the talk. I'm going to, I have a handout. I've put a link to the handout in the chat and there'll be a more concise uh, form of the handout that, that you will be getting the link to after the talk. But after I go over the handout and some things like resources and safety, I'm going to be talking about th three parts, common plants in your yard and your garden, and I've divided that up into plants that we will see more likely in early spring to middle spring, and then from late spring into summer. And these are all plants that commonly grow in your yard, in your gardens, and they're really easy to find. Some of you find them very annoying and wish they would go away. And I've also included a couple that only show up in the spring, but they're out right now, and it's really fun to see them. And I always wonder, I always used to wonder what they were. Now I know what they are and I go out and find them and eat them. So I've included that. Then there is a small section on some commonly grown herbs and some of their uses because herbs are great for so much more than just putting in your Thanksgiving turkey. And then I thought it would be great if I just helped you to know something about how to identify poison ivy and a couple of other vines that grow all around here in New England because so many people hesitate to go out and start foraging or doing anything outdoors because they're like, oh my God, what if I get poison ivy? It can be fairly easy to know what it is. So that's what we're gonna do. And I want to say that 
Any mention of medicinal uses for plants is for informational purposes only. I'm not diagnosing or prescribing uh, herbs for any medical uses. And if you have any medical issues that you're looking to use herbs for, I recommend that you go to a qualified medical practitioner, healthcare practitioner. Okay, so what is on your handout is I've given you resources, including books, websites, blogs, and apps, a few. I've given you some safety reminders, and then I've given you a list of the plants we're going to go over tonight in alphabetical order by common name. I've also included on the handouts the botanical names and some of the uses of the weeds and the herbs. There are actually uses for poison ivy, but I don't go into that. So let me start with Oh no, come on. Yay. All right. Okay, so. So what we're doing tonight, a review of talk, what's on your handout, where to get more information, points of safety, sustainability, what you can do with the plants, and then we get to the plants. So where to get more information, books. I am a huge believer in using books. I know I'm old school, but there is just so much missing information out there on the web. And books, especially books that have been through various editions have been vetted so that the information is correct to the best of our knowledge. When you are going out to identify plants, I recommend having three different kinds of field guides. One is a general field guide because you will find so many more plants than you would find in a more specialized field guide. And also, a number of useful plants are not necessarily included in specialized field guides because they can only include so much. So a general field guide. Field guides for medicinal plants and field guides for edible plants. I also highly recommend using more than one field guide for each area. So if you're going to use a general field guide, something like Newcomb's Wildflower Guide, Audubon, Peterson's, there are a number of them. There are several, uh, there are a number of guides on, on wild foods and a number of guides on wild medicines. And different books are going to have different descriptions, are going to have different drawings, are also to some extent going to in, include different lists of plants. And it can be really helpful because it will give you a way to learn to identify plants Everybody has a different way of learning and taking things in. And so when you have more than one book, it helps you to understand different things about the plants and really helps you to identify them. There, I've also included a few websites and blogs. There are lots of them out there. I have a lot of herbalists and foragers that I know online. I've just included a couple of resources I sort of get overwhelmed if there are too many, so I don't use that many. I've also given you a couple of apps. Okay, I'm not a big fan of apps. Again, I'm old school, but one thing I've seen is that sometimes they can be really great at identifying a plant depending on the app, and sometimes they're really lousy. And especially if you need to identify something to make sure whether it's poisonous or not poisonous, you really want to be very sure of your ID. And I, eh, I'm not big on apps. That's my own opinion. And then um, I've just given you re uh, links to a couple of foragers and wild crafters and herbalists that are online. So points of safety, make sure you know what plant you are harvesting, know it by name. And one of the reasons that we call plants names is so that we can communicate with each other about what plant we're talking about, so that we know that we're on the same page about talking about a plant. Now, many plants will have more than one common name. There are common names that will apply to more than one plant. And this is the beauty of scientific names. Generally, 
a scientific name only applies to one plant 99% of the time. There may be more than one scientific name applied to the plant, depending on how many botanists have ID'd it. And a problem <laughs> that some of us foragers and herbalists are knocking our heads against now is that botanists, especially with the the uh, on, on coming, uh, being able to get down to the DNA of things, all sorts of plants are being reclassified and renamed and it drives me nuts. And that is one of the few times when I really will go to Wikipedia, it generally seems to have the latest name for a plant. So when I'm trying to find the, the latest proper scientific name for a plant, I'll check with Wikipedia. But I wanted to give you an example. So. Pigweed is a fairly common name to call a plant. There are various plants called pigweeds. And if I am talking about this plant where my, my pointer is to a friend, and I'm saying, oh, pigweed is great. You know, it's got a red root. It's got these kind of crenellated leaves. And my friend says, no, pigweed isn't like that. Pigweed, you know, it, it doesn't have a red root at all. It's got this whitish stuff in the center of the leaves. I'm like, what are you talking about? If I say to my friend, I'm talking about Amaranthus retroflexus, and my friend says, oh, I'm talking about Kenopodium album. Hey, we both know what we're talking about. So, and knowing what plant you are harvesting can make a difference between edibility and palatability. There are plants that are edible that do not taste good. There are some plants that are known as uh, starvation foods that only taste good when you're starving. It can make a difference medicinally between whether or not a plant will be efficacious or not, whether it will work or not. And sometimes it can make a difference as to whether or not a plant can be poisonous or not. Good to know your plants. Two other things that have to do with, with safety as well as just generally foraging and wildcrafting and even harvesting in your gardening garden is knowing what part of a plant to harvest and knowing what time of year to harvest it. So say if I'm harvesting dandelion, the very first leaves in the spring are the youngest and tenderest. So that's the time of year when I want to harvest them. If say I was going to harvest from pokeweed, which is not included in this slideshow, but it's one of our native plants. Pokeweed is actually uh, poisonous. All parts are poisonous. It has those beautiful purple berries you see in the fall. The root is used medicinally, but the very young shoots when they come up in the spring are edible and taste rather like asparagus, I've been told. I've never gotten there early enough to try it, but that's what I hear. So that is the part to harvest and what time of year to harvest it and no other time of year. And lastly, check if you're compatible with ingesting the plant. If you've never tried it before, maybe just try a little bit. I have a friend who I met through another friend and this other friend had dug up a whole lot of daylily tubers. Again, sorry, I'm not talking about daylily today, but anyway, the tubers are edible. And so this, my new friend and his friend went home and cooked up this whole mess of daylily tubers and chowed down and were really sick. And I was like, if you talk to me, because daylilies are actually one of those plants where some people have a reaction to it, some don't. And if they talked to me and I'd said, just try a little bit at first, they might've been a whole lot happier, but anyway. And then lastly, really important, when in doubt, don't. If you're not sure if it's edible, if you're not sure if it's safe, just don't. And I'll tell you, if I, as I've learned over the years, I've let go of some plants that afterwards I found out, oh, they were fine but I wasn't sure. And once or twice I have, by listening to myself, kept from ingesting a poisonous plant, which I was really thankful for. I was like, okay, that's a good idea. Don't eat it. Another thing to know, and this is basically if you're going outside your yard or your garden, but say even if you're going into your neighbor's yard, oh, there's not enough in my yard. I'm gonna go into my neighbor's yard. Know that it's clean not where dogs roam and go to the bathroom, not where soil is contaminated or where pesticides and herbicides have been used. Sometimes you simply don't know. Sometimes maybe you're gonna 
harvest from ground that's contaminated and hopefully you'll be okay. Sometimes you can do, do research and find out, but as much as possible, please be careful not to ingest more of these uh, poisons into your body than is necessary. And when you're foraging also, avoid breaking laws or making the landowner mad, get your family's or your neighbor's permission. I have had the police show up, my, show up at my door after I wandered into somebody's yard looking at the plants in their yard. Um, I once was in a farmer's field picking dandelion flowers. The farmer came out and was quite irate. And I'm thinking, what do you want with the dandelions? What's the problem? But he didn't like me on his property. So there it is. Good idea to get permission. And sustainability and respect for all beings. Foraging wild plants is great. It's free food. That doesn't mean we just go out and pick all the plant we want, just as much as we want. And this is really how some of our most valuable medicinal plants became endangered and are going extinct, such as American ginseng and golden seal. And lady slippers, um, I think it's the pink lady slippers, or is it the yellow, the yellow lady slippers. So um, don't take more than you need if you can figure out or just, you know, be reasonable about how much you're taking. If you're growing and foraging in your own yard or garden, it's really less of a concern. But if you're foraging somewhere else, remember a third for humans. And remember there are more humans than you that may want the plant, a third for the animals and the insects and a third left for the plants. You want to let the plants be able to regenerate and come back and so on. Know what is really endangered and leave it there. Um, the exception to this, I would say, is if plants are invasive at that point, I would say take as much as you want. And then what can you do with the plants? There's so much you can do. You can cook soup, salads, stir fries, baked goods, make infused vinegars, make medicines, body care, crafts, dehydrate. And sometimes you can decide whether to use a plant fresh or dried or both. So early to late spring. The first plant I'm talking about is burdock. Burdock is one of the plants that came with the settlers because it's such good food and medicine. It is a biennial, meaning that the first year it just puts out leaves, hangs out, dies back in the fall, comes back the next spring, puts out leaves again, puts up its bloom stalk, blooms, sets seed, and dies. So this is a first year burdock. This is probably the beginning of a second year burdock. You can eat the very young leaves, like maybe these very young leaves here. They are rather bitter, not my favorite way to work with burdock. I prefer to dry the leaves and use them in teas, which are medicinal, or to dry them and use them in my everything but the kitchen sink stock, which is basically where I use whatever plants I've dried, whatever ends of vegetables, eggshells, and so on. And I make soup stock or broth, and I've included the recipe for that in your handouts. One of the things about burdock, which helps you distinguish it from other plants, one is it has kind of a heart shape, the leaves, the way they go into the stem. The other is that it has this white woolly back, the back of the leaves, they're green on top, but lighter, but whitish on underneath. Burdock, the root, the first year root is also edible any time of the year. So from when it starts growing through the fall and into very early spring, once it starts putting up its bloom stalk, the wood, the, the root gets too woody and fibrous to eat. Blech, you don't want to eat it. And something you can, other parts of the plant are edible. If you are going to harvest the root for medicine, the best time to do so is late in fall or early spring, when the plant really has its energy down in the roots, it's focused in its roots, it's going to have most of its nutrients and its constituents focused in its roots, not looking to grow up. And the Japanese eat, um, eat burdock, they, they call it gobo and they eat it pickled, they really love burdock. 
Our next plant is chickweed, which also came over with the settlers. Again, really good food and medicine. This is an annual. It only blooms, it, it, it uh, just grows for one year, blooms and sets seed and dies. It is a cool weather plant. So you'll notice it's starting to come out in early spring, usually disappears by midsummer, and then starts coming back in the fall once it starts cooling down. And this is a plant I've actually seen chickweed growing in the winter, like in December, when there are, it's snowy, but there are patches of bare ground and I will see chickweed growing. So being a cool weather plant, chickweed also is a cooling plant. Its medicine is cooling and it can be used as in teas to drink. It can be used externally. It's a good skin healing herb. Um, it's also anti-inflammatory for skin diseases. This is one of the, the, the herbs that I don't think really is worth drying. It, it's, even though it's a sturdy little plant, it doesn't have much oomph to it when it's dried and it doesn't really hold anything to it. So I myself do not think that it's worth drying it and nor do I think it's worth buying it dried and using it. It has these lovely little flowers that are white. They look like little stars. They are five petals, but they're very deeply cleft so that they look like it's 10 petals. The, the, the leaves are oval and they are opposite each other on the stem, opposite each other. And the stems are very interesting. They have a single line of hairs that will be on one side of the stem between two leaves. Then between the next two sets of leaves, they'll be on the other side of the stem. And then they go back to the first side. Whoops, sorry. Um, which is really interesting. You can eat the, the leaves, the flowers, the seed pods. I find that once it goes to seed, it is too stringy. And at that point, I won't bother eating the stems. I'll just pull the leaves and the seed pods off the stems. This is a great one for salads. One of my favorite ways to eat it. Dandelion. I don't think there's anybody on this call who doesn't recognize dandelion. So dandy starts coming up early in the spring. It can have these wide leaves with somewhat toothed edges, or it can have narrower leaves with very deeply toothed lobes. It starts coming up in early spring, which is the best time that the leaves are going to be least bitter. They taste the best then. It is also the best time to get the root if you are going to use the root medicinally. As with burdock, the best time to harvest the root for medicine is late fall or early spring. You can harvest the root any time of the year to eat, but it's going to be more bitter later in the season. You can also eat the leaves later in the season, but they're, again, they're gonna be very bitter. You could cook them in a couple changes of water or cook them with other greens or chop them up, say in a salad with other greens that are much milder. It will help um, mitigate the bitter taste. Though the bitter is very useful and very um, healthy for the liver and the gut. And the root of dandelion is, is known specifically as a liver herb. The leaves are actually used as a diuretic. They will help your body. They have been used to help your body uh, get rid of excess fluids. So all parts of the plant are edible, roots, leaves, stems. People will even eat this, the stems. I've never tried it, I can't imagine. The flowers, you could pick a few flowers and rip them apart into your salad. There are all sorts of recipes out there for baking with, with um, the flowers, for cooking with the leaves. Dandelion wine is a classic for making with the flowers. And I actually have made dandelion wine and dandelion mead, which is made with honey rather than sugar, which is really cool and really fun. And this is the root of dandelion. You can see it's quite long. And Harriet has all these little roots that help it to grow. And dandelion is perennial, so it comes back year after year. And it is another plant that came over with the settlers because it was such important food and medicine. And a lot of these plants that I'm showing you came from elsewhere and they were brought over because 
they were really important to the settlers, but they found they liked it here. And so they escaped and they naturalized themselves. And that's why, you know, we think, oh, it's always been here. Well, 500 years, 600 years ago, they weren't here. This is one of our spring ephemerals. So this is dead nettle, called that because it vaguely resembles stinging nettle, but dead because it, it doesn't sting, no stings. This also came over with the settlers. This is in the mint family, and it has that square stem that plants in the mint family have, though not all plants with square stems are in the mint family. It has leaves that tend to cluster closely at the top of the stem. It has the typical mint family flower, labiate, which means it has lips. Here's an upper lip, here's a lower lip. It's purplish, the leaf tends to get purplish as it goes towards the stem. It will grow in clusters here and there. And it's, it's soft and juicy, and I just like to throw it in soups. My go-tos, you ask me, what are you gonna do with it? Soups or stir fries, or dry it for soup in the winter. So this goes great in soup. This is garlic mustard. Again, it came over with the settlers. Now this is considered invasive. So I invite you to pick as much of this as you like. This is a biennial. And so that means that the first year it just puts up leaves. And then the second year it puts up its bloom stalk blooms and sets seed. So you can see these are first year leaves. They, they might've started sprouting by now, but you can find these throughout the first year. They are two, they are somewhat rounded. They have this lobe, this lobed uh, cleft where they meet the stem. One of the best ways to know that it's garlic mustard is if you take the leaf and crush it and it smells garlicky, garlic mustard. As the name says, it is in the mustard family and you can eat the first year leaves, the second year leaves, you can eat the, the flowers, you can eat the seed pods. And if you pick the flowering stem before it's too gone too far towards seed, it's fairly, uh, fairly soft and, and palatable. Otherwise you'll be stripping off the leaves and the flowers and the seeds, all of which are edible. The roots can be used like horseradish. I've used them in making fire cider vinegar. I don't know if they're too fibrous to chop up and eat or not. I've, I've not tried that. I'm not a big horseradish person. I don't like very, very um, mustardy things. Henbit, this is our other uh, spring ephemeral. It's also again in the mint family with that square stem. It has more deeply lobed leaves. It has that labiate flower. You can see the two, the two um, lips. And this again grows in the spring and then disappears. You can eat it. I like to mix it with henbit and one other plant, ground ivy, that I'll be showing you. And so basically, yeah, this is just good eating. And being in the mint family has lots of nutrients and minerals in it. This is ground ivy. Again, this came over with the settlers and <laughs> It can really take over your lawn. I wanted you to see what it's like. When you see this in a lawn, a lot of time it, it's, it's ground ivy. Again, it is in the mint family. And you can see it also has labiate flowers, though they're different than the other ones we've looked at. Here's the top lip and here's the bottom lip that's very lobed. It is a perennial. And so what it does, and this is why it just will spread through the lawn, which is why it's called ground and ivy, I guess, because the, the leaves are somewhat lobed like English ivy. I invited this plant into my garden and she rudely just took over the whole thing. So I've been pulling this plant out for years. You can see that what it does is it grows up. It's, it's got roots here, then it puts out a stem, 
falls down to the ground, puts up some more leaves, puts out another root, falls down, roots itself. This will go right through other clumps of plants. I've had it growing into all sorts of things. It's amazing. However, it is good food and medicine. The best time to harvest it for medicine is when it is blooming. And it has traditionally been used for kidney issues, I believe for the adrenals, um, various other, other issues. It's diuretic, it will help heal wounds. You can also harvest it any time of the, the summer and eat the leaves. I find it difficult though, because then I have to kind of separate the leaves from the root. But a lot of times when I'm weeding it, I'll just take it home and, and just take off the leaves and throw them in soup. This has a strong flavor that I do not like. It is not as strong first thing in the, the spring when it comes up. I have a friend that when I first introduced him to ground ivy, he said, oh, this is so good. It tastes like lamb with mint jelly. I'm like, okay. He loves it. I'm like, oh, but when I cook it, it loses that, um, it loses a lot of that taste. And so I like it. I, I think it's got a lot of nutrients. It makes me happy when I eat it. Ah, okay. I got my slides slightly out of order, but I wanted to show you these three plants all tend to come out at the same time in the spring and can be so difficult to identify. And I've spent so much time getting to know them so that I could finally tell which one is which. And believe me, I get down on my knees and really look closely. So this is dead nettle, which has the leaves growing closer to the top of the stem. The leaves are somewhat heart-shaped, I would say. They've got a lot of purple as they get closer to the stem. They've got a pinker flower. And the leaves, there's a long, can be a long stem before it reaches the leaves. This is hembit. It has greener leaves. They are more deeply lobed. They also tend to be smaller. The flowers are a darker pink. It also has, the buds are much redder than with the other plants. And then this is ground ivy and it just kind of tends to grow in a tumble. It'll have a lot of leaves. They are somewhat kidney shaped or roundish. They do look sometimes like, I sometimes get them confused with garlic mustard, but once I crush a leaf and smell it, I know which one I'm looking at. And they tend to have many more flowers than these two. Ground ivy tends to grow much more uh, spread out. It, it tends to grow over much larger areas than either the, the dead nettle or the hen. And then lastly for coming up in spring is violets. I love violets. And these are one of our native species of violets. There are a few native species. This is the one that grows everywhere. Some lawn lovers hate it. You get it in your garden. I invited Violet into my garden too, and she was not the most uh, polite guest. <laughs> so Violet loves to spread itself. And it is just a marvelous plant. It is best to harvest it in the spring. And what's fun is that these flowers, they don't have much taste, but they're really pretty to put into your, your salad or on top of a drink or whatever. You can candy them. And these flowers are sterile, meaning that they don't reproduce. So you can pick as many of them as you want within reason, because what happens is that a little later in the season, violets have what are called cleistogamous flowers, which means they have these little flowers that are brown that grow very close to the ground that never actually open up. They're self-fertilizing inside themselves. And then they form seed and then they split open in three, I don't know if you can see this, in three, um, in three parts like, like a, um, like a viola, viola um, pod. And what happens when those, those little pods split open, they burst, they throw the seed around, which helps Violet to spread. It also spreads by root extension. And this can be a very rambunctiously spready plant. 
So the flowers are really good nutrition. They are also used medicinally. The leaves are really good nutrition and tasty, very mild flavored. And I love to eat them fresh. I also like to pick them and dry them. I like to dry both the leaves and the flowers for tea later in the season. I also like to dry the leaves to use in cooking later in the season. And one of the ways to know that it's violet, go out and look at the violets. They are so cool because they are the only plant that I know of that the leaf opens, it has this little curl on either side, it folds in on itself like that. And you can see it kind of doing that there and, and, and there. It is the most extraordinary thing. And I hope you will go out this spring and go find them. They will, the leaves will last throughout the season, but I find that once you start getting into summer, the slugs are fond of them. Sometimes there's some sort of a fungus that gets on them and they're just like, ugh, not really something I care to harvest. So I try and grab them in the spring. So when we come to late spring into early summer, Amaranth, which I showed you before. This is a plant that has come, it's actually native to Central and South America, and it gradually made its way up through the up through the North American continent, and I believe has been here for hundreds of years. And it is quite a rambunctious weed. There are gardeners who really hate it. I'm very happy to see it because I'm like, yay, you're really good food. So this plant is, one of its nicknames is red root. And I hope you can see that it has a reddish root, which is one of the ways to tell it. And actually what happens is that it has a reddish root and the red will go up into the stem. And as it grows, the, it continues to have some red in the stem. Um, stop that. Whoops, sorry. Come on, computer, please behave. Okay, um, the leaves are somewhat, I, if you're seeing this square, I don't know why my computer is misbehaving. Anyway, the leaves are somewhat oval, very slightly toothed. They look rather puckered or seersuckery when they're young. You can see that the, the plant can get quite tall, up to uh, uh, up to three feet even. You can eat the leaves, they're best when they're young, but even when it starts to bloom, you can eat the leaves. They're, they're, they're more tender when they're young like this. You could put them in salads, put them in soups. I really like to dry them to use for, for um, eating in the winter. And I just took, a bunch of my dried greens, including amaranth leaves, and ground them up to make sort of a powder so that I could just throw green powder in my soup. The, it's an annual, so it, it does its whole cycle in one year. The, the, you can see the seed, the seed stalks. You can harvest their seeds. They're very tiny and black. And you'll get a lot of chaff. Get rid of as much chaff as you can, and then don't worry about it. You can use the seeds, you can throw them in soup or whatever, you can grind them up and cook with them. They are uh, high in protein and nutritious, or you can leave your amaranth standing and let the wild birds feed from them. Again, this is burdock, and burdock, this being the uh, biennial, this is its second year. Okay, so you will see it doing this throughout the summer. That is the first year, just kind of hanging out, doing its thing. This is the second year. I'm sure most, if not all of you have seen this great big blooming stalk and it happens in late spring to early summer. It's interesting because it doesn't really have flowery flowers. It has a, a rather thorny, ball and then it has a tuft of purple flowers at the top 
and gradually the flowers disappear and then it's just that that brown burr that gets caught in your dog's coat and and that makes you so mad um and that was actually the inspiration for the development of velcro some people have peeled the young bloom stalk i've never gotten around to it it seems like too much work the seeds are somewhat edible they're kind of bitter but eh. and also the seeds are medicinal so the roots leaves seeds are medicinal and the first year root like i said is edible so from here and this you can find throughout the summer red clover oh Red clover, red clover and white clover were both introduced. And red clover, it's a much, tends to be a much larger, more vigorous appearing plant than white clover. Red clover has a very clear chevron on each of its three leaflets that you can see here. And it has that familiar purple flower we think we call it red clover, clover, it's actually purple. And you can pick a few of the flowers and rip them up, sprinkle them in your salad. The flowers can be hard to digest uncooked, so it's better to use clover flowers cooked. You, these are the flowers that are collected and used <clears throat> medicinally for a lot of herbal teas and for lymphatics and, and other medicinal uses. You can dry the, hold on. Yes, the flowers can be used fresh in salads, dried, they can be used in teas. You can also take the, the flowers that are dry and grind them up and use them as flour. And the leaves can also be eaten raw or cooked or used as tea. If you're going to harvest the flowers, you go out every day or two and you try and get a flower that has no brown on it. It tends to start turning brown from underneath. At that point, it really is going to lose its efficacy. It's not going to look good. It's gonna dry brown. It's not gonna have much going for it. Do not pick that. This is starting to go slightly brown. So when it's, nice and fresh and you just spread them out in a single layer and let them dry and then put them in a jar or in a paper bag and dry them and then you can use them for for whatever you like white clover has the white it is a creeping vi a uh, creeping plant it, it spreads by root extension and basically it can be used the same way as red clover it also has medicinal uses that some of them may be different than red clover, but edibility, it's pretty much the same. Dandelion, I just wanted to show you. It, you will find it blooming intermittently throughout the summer. You can also, again, pull up the root throughout the summer if you would like to eat it, make medicine with it, whatever. Um, it's not my favorite time to eat the root, but sometimes that's what I'll do is just grab it and, and eat it in, in the middle of the summer. And then here are the leaves. Again, garlic mustard and late spring into summer is when you will see it blooming. It is in the mustard family. And as with other plants in the cruciferous family, it has a flower with four petals in the form of a cross, which is one of the ways to know it. And you can see it has these little seed pods that are kind of sticking up there. And that is typical of some plants in the mustard family. Goosefoot, ah, one of my favorite plants. This is an annual. I believe it was introduced, though there are other species that are native to this, this, uh, this side of the world. And so this is called goosefoot or lamb's quarters. It's called goosefoot because the leaf has kind of the shape of a goosefoot. The leaves grow alternately up the stem, so it will grow, one leaf will grow on one side and then the next leaf will grow further up on the other side. And so they will alternate sides where they grow out of the stem. They can have somewhat uh, 
shorter, uh, more triangular leaves, or they can have somewhat longer leaves. One of the things that is really typical of this plant is that you can see in the middle, just where the leaf is coming out of the stalk or right up here, it has a whitish powder and that is not anything wrong with it. It's actually part of what the plant does. You can eat the leaves whenever they come out. They are softer and more tender when they're younger. I tend to start to, to find it when it's blooming and I'm like, oh, well, I'm just gonna get your leaves anyway. Um, salads, uh, cooking, they can be used in all sorts of ways. It is known also as wild spinach. It's actually in the same family as spinach is. And it can be used in the same ways you would use spinach as a cooked herb in spinach pie, spinacopita, salads, whatever. If you're going to cook with it though, know that it is a very moist herb and it will lose a lot of water in the cooking. Oh, and the seeds are also edible. Again, you can harvest them, try and blow away the chaff and grind them and use them as, as a flower. Okay, ground ivy, you will, it will pretty much stop blooming by the middle of the summer, but again, you will see it growing around. Pull it up, you'll, you'll notice it doing this. There are two kinds of plantains that also came over with the settlers because they were such useful medicine. Whoops. The first is broadleaf plantain, and I'm sure you've seen these around. It's perennial. It has these broad leaves with these very strong, clearly defined veins in them that actually, if you pull them apart, they have a little string in the back that you can pull out. And they bloom uh, starting in early summer. This is the bloom stalk. You can see this has flowers opening. This one just has buds. And then you probably are familiar with seeing these seed stalks. You can eat the very young leaves, but I have never found them to be particularly palatable. They tend to me to be very tough, but some people swear by cooking and eating the leaves, different strokes for different folks. You can certainly dry the leaves for tea or for your everything but the kitchen sink soup stock. It is a very medicinal plant. It is somewhat cooling. It also um, is very healing to various mucous membranes of the body, both internally and externally. And it is a plant that's been nicknamed nature's band-aid because if you're out somewhere and you get a sting and you're not alerted to whatever stung you, or you get a, an insect bite, or you've touched up against some stinging nettle, you can grab a few leaves, chew them up, make, that's called a spit poultice, slap it on whatever is ailing you and it will really help take out the sting or the burn or whatever. You're going to have to replace it in a while, but it really is helpful. And I've done this a number of times. It's also one of my favorite plants for skincare and I will infuse it in olive oil or sesame seed oil and use it to help heal my skin and soothe my skin. And then this is narrow leaved or English plantain. You've probably seen this too, and it will really take over in a field. And I will, these can be used interchangeably. And this one has much narrower leaves. It still has very uh, strong, obvious veins in the leaves. And this one has a long stalk before it flowers and makes seed. The seeds of both narrow leaved and broad leaved planting can be used. You can harvest them, winnow them as best you can. Don't worry about the chaff after that grind them up, use them as uh, a flower, or they make a good laxative. They make a good bulk laxative. Queen Anne's lace is pretty much the same as our, as our um, carrot, our, our garden carrot. Make sure that when you see it, it's biennial, make sure that you can tell the difference between it and poison hemlock. Queen Anne's lace always has hairy stems. It will always smell of carrot when you break the stem and smell it. It does not always have this red flower in the middle, but often it does. 
It is biennial. The first year, it'll just put up its leaves like this. You can eat the leaves and the root the first year as long as you're sure that it's um, Queen Anne's lace. The second year, it will put up its bloom stalks. The leaves, uh, the flowers are edible. The leaves you can also eat at that point. And once it goes to seed, you can eat the seeds. They're rather carroty tasting. You don't want to eat the roots the second year because they will be rather woody and not, you're just not gonna be able to eat them. Okay. Um, and wood sorrel looks rather like, what's that called? It looks rather like clover, but it's not, it has much more deeply cleft leaves, uh, much more heart shaped. It's a darker green. It has these little yellow five petaled flowers in the middle. It is annual. It grows all over. It has got a sour taste, so it's also known as sour grass. You can eat the leaves, you can eat the flowers, you can eat the, the seed pods. Once it starts getting more, getting older, it, the stem gets more fibrous and woody. When it's really young, you can eat the whole above ground plant. Once it gets older, I strip off the leaves and, and the flowers. You don't want to eat an awful lot of this because it's got a high oxalic acid content, but it's a great little nibble or to add to your, to add to your salads. And this is often what people, if they're out hiking, they'll just nibble on this to help keep away thirst. So some commonly grown herbs, basil. I know that we think of like, oh, this is great, you know, to use with tomato thing uh, dishes, but I actually love basil for, I love it as a tea. To me, when I dry it and drink it as a tea, it makes me feel better. It makes me, it lifts my spirit. And it's in the mint family and is with other herbs in the mint family that I'm going to be talking about. Generally, they can, you can use a tea and they're helpful if you're getting a cold or the flu. They will help with gas, they're carminative, so they help with gas. They can help your digestion. And the re one of the reasons why these herbs became included in our, in our cooking was because they had all these wonderful qualities and properties to offer us. And so when we added them to our food, not only did they taste good, but they helped us digest our food and they helped also, if we cooked them in with our food, they helped to preserve our food. Oh, and another thing is, that sometimes just pick a few fresh leaves and, and rip them up and put them in your salad. And there's so much more you can do with, with basil than just pesto. Yes, also traditionally have been used to help with nausea and fevers and headaches. Echinacea is used medicinally and I included it because I love to pick the flowers and dry them. And I will put them like on, on a, put them, the stem into a bottle and let the, the, flower, the petals kind of dry down around the bottle neck. They're just so pretty when they're dried and I've used them in, in herbal wreaths. And so I wanted to include that as something to do. Plus if you grow them and you leave them out there, finches and other wild birds really enjoy eating the seeds in the fall and they are good, so they are good for our feathered friends. Lemon balm is in the mint family. Lemony, put it in your salads. It's got the same good uses as other, other plants in the mint family. In addition, it is anti-anxiety and antidepressants, one of my favorite herbs to drink. And it's, um, it doesn't last well once it's dried. You want to use the dried plant up within a few months. Mints, spearmint, peppermint, and so on. You can use the flowers. You can dry the flowers and use them in wreaths. You can use the flowers and infuse them in honey. You can use, uh, besides drying the flowers or and the, the leaves for tea, you can infuse them in honeys, in vinegar to make a delicious vinegar, in uh, and, and tincture them and so on. Oregano 
same uses as, as the others. Oregano, I think is particularly antimicrobial. I love it for that. And I love to dry the clusters of flowers to use in my herbal reeds. They dry delicately and beautifully. Sage. Broadleaf sage, this is Burgarten sage, a uh, particular species. This is narrow leaf sage. Or, um, the garden sage, it is, you can use the, the flowers if you like. I love to dry the sage and just make arrangements with it. It is, of course, very tasty. It is a, a plant that when you use it in teas or for medicines, you only use a little bit because it has a lot of thujone, which is not good for you if you get a lot of it medicinally. Um, but it has a lot of good medicinal uses. It also is astringent. So traditionally nursing moms would use it to dry up their milk. And this is one that I like to use uh, infused in vinegar for people that have oily skin. It's a great one to use as a wash or as an infused vinegar if you have oily skin. In thyme, there are a number of different kinds of thyme. The, the English thyme and French thyme, the, the shrubby thymes are considered to be more medicinal than the creeping thymes. I think that I use whatever thyme I have available, creeping or shrubby. Medicinally, it is one of my favorite herbs for when I'm getting a cold. I love to make a tea with it. It is antimicrobial. Um, I think it is also antifungal, if I'm remembering right. It is really one of my favorite anti-flu and anti-cold herbs. And also sometimes it's fun to just dry the flowers. For reasons, the other thing, it's so lovely to, I will sometimes just use the flowers and just pick a bunch of flowers and throw them in some honey and make thyme honey. And then like when I've got a cold or something in the winter and I'm making myself lemon tea and just throw in some thyme honey, or it can be great uh, for those of you that eat meat, you could use it to put on top of your chicken and it's just a lovely tiny Swedish taste, sweetish taste on top of your chicken. All right, poison ivy. Poison ivy has these shiny green leaves, three leaflets. You can see right here, these are the, the buds and it flowers and I think it has white berries in the, in the fall. You can see here, it likes to climb up trees and you can see how it is clinging to the bark of the tree, really clinging. So three leaflets, three leaflets, it clings and it has these tiny little hairy roots that you can see right here, it looks, unfortunately, I'm not able to enlarge this right now, it has these little air rootlets. It uses these rootlets to cling to the bark. So if you see a vine climbing up a tree with little hairy roots coming off of it, tiny, tiny thread-like roots, that is poison ivy. Do not touch it because even in the winter time, you can see this is winter. Even in the winter, it still has that urushiol oil. You will get a rash from it. This is bittersweet, which is has a different kind of bark and is growing. You can see it's growing on top of the poison ivy and it has no roots growing out from it. It's just kind of leaning there. And what it's doing is it's, it's twisting around the tree and it's going to go up here and go around and around. And poison, I mean, bittersweet, which is next, bittersweet tends to wind around trees and can strangle them. It, this is the familiar uh, orange and yellow berries. And actually this the oriental bittersweet is, is very invasive. So it's best to try not to take the, these and use them in the winter. If you're going to use them for decoration, throw them in the trash, not the compost. It's a perennial because it keeps growing and growing. It has somewhat rounded leaves. You can see these are the buds of when it is blooming in the spring. And you can see that these, these, this branch is just kind of hanging out there. And bittersweet will grow up. It will throw up um, 
a vine and kind of go around and then just kind of hang down from the trees. So if you go somewhere and you see a big old vine that is kind of starting from the ground and just going up the trunk of the tree like that, but not clinging to it, it's bittersweet and it's not poison ivy. And then lastly, this is a plant, this is Virginia creeper. It is native as is poison ivy. It has five leaflets, five, count them, five, not to be, so you know. And this also will grow up the tree trunks. However, the, the vine will be somewhat jointed in places. It's got a little joint here and it will be jointed even though you don't see it here. And again, it does not have those little root hairs that help it to cling to the, the uh, tree. So I hope that this gives you an idea of, I hope this gives you an idea of what you can, of how to identify poison ivy so that you may be a little less scared of it when you're going out and foraging. And now I would be happy to take questions. Thank you, Iris. That was amazing. I feel like I've learned so much. Um, we do have some comments and some questions in the chat, so I will go just go through them. We had a couple of people saying that they had made pesto out of garlic mustard. Yes. Um, and somebody asked for a recipe. I looked online. I didn't see one through PBS, but there were a bunch of them that were looked really good. So you, um, um, Mia, go I, I basically have um, Call of the Wild Roots pesto or something like that. I'll send you a recipe you can send out after this. Awesome, <laughs> even better. <laughs> um, Deborah says that beekeepers love plantain salves. Yes. Um, Pat wanted to know, what did you suggest differentiating Queen Anne's lace from? We weren't really sure what were the words you used. Poison hemlock, which is not the hemlock tree. The hemlock tree that is native to this continent is a lovely tree. It is actually edible and medicinal. Poison hemlock is a plant that's also in the carrot family. It is what Socrates used to kill himself. And it can look somewhat like Queen Anne's lace. However, poison hemlock has smooth stems with swollen joints. They are somewhat, they can be somewhat purply speckled. When you break the stem and, and crush it, it does not smell good. And Queen Anne's lace, another herbalist, I learned this from her, the queen has hairy knees. Queen <laughs> Anne's lace has hairy stems and smells of carrot. And this is one of those plants where like, if, if you're not sure, you're like, I'm pretty sure, but I'm not quite, don't. Because poison hemlock is very poisonous and its cousin water hemlock that is native to this continent is one that I met on a plant walk I was doing one day and I was like, I wonder what that is. Oh, it looks like it's in that family. All right, I better not. And I went home and I ID'd it and it's very poisonous. I'm like, so glad I didn't put that in my mouth. It wouldn't have been good to be, you know, maybe keeling over in front of my students or whatever. <laughs> I would agree with that. Um, Janice asked, does burdock grow along a driveway? It certainly can. Okay. Um, let me see. And Pat said the Virginia creeper also climbs trees and has tiny, hairy, clingy roots. Is that right? It has tendrils that will have a little adhesive pad at the end, mm -hmm. but it's not the, the, it's not like caterpillary the way um, poison ivy is sort of caterpillary. And if, if, um, if anybody has questions and want to, wants to ask me more, you can email me at info at irisweaver.com. I am happy to answer questions. Thank you. I will put that in um, the recap as well. And I just put it in the chat. Um, Kitty asks, what about purslane? Purslane is wonderful. It is. It comes out somewhat later in the season. I had to choose how many plants I was going to include. I love purslane. I think it's vastly underrated. It is the hot, It has the highest concentration of omega threes in a vegetable form. I highly recommend that you eat it. 
It is somewhat mucilaginous, so some people don't like it. Um, yeah, eat it. Okay. <laughs> Good to know. And um, Janice then asked, how can I get rid of burdock? Um, good luck. You're going to have to dig really deep because if you leave part of the root, it will be back. You could try putting black plastic over it. You could try talking to it. And if you want to know about talking to plants, get in touch with me. I'm happy to talk to you about it because I'm perfectly serious about that. Mm -hmm. Mint is the same way, right? It's very hard to get rid of. Oh my God. <laughs> It is. I've grown mint in like large pots and um, and it goes all the way down and then it goes out the bottom of the pot and then it creeps over to the next pot and comes up. It is so. Oh, my God, it is just aggressive. Mm -hmm. And I don't often use that word for a plant. <laughs> I completely agree about mint. We've had it in our backyard. We just can't get rid of it. Kathleen sends us a, um, a recipe for getting rid of poison ivy that's not toxic. Spray, spray area with two gallons soapy water, two, three pounds salt, a few dousings. You'll need that. Um, got Robert, Roberta, do you find that you bring in clo clothes moss when you bring in herbs to dry and overwinter? Oh, gosh, no, no. Clothes moths actually will be repelled by fragrant herbs. I do not find, if you're talking about moths, those are what are called Indian meal moths. And if you have them, say, coming in in your cereal or grains, if you do not have your herbs well put away, possibly they can invade. I may have had that happen years ago. It's not a problem I tend to have. Okay. Um, so with all of the plants that you've talked about, you know, we were talking about like backyard foraging, how many of how, like what percentage of them are things that we would find in like Lexington, the Lexington area, just kind of growing wildly? You should find all of them. Mm -hmm. That's why I chose them. Okay. I just wanted to make sure. Um, Kitty asks, is amaranth reflect, re, retroflexus the only native amaranth? There is a broadleaf version in the Mediterranean called Vieta that is used in salads. Is there version? Is this version better tasting than our native one? I have no idea if it's better tasting. There are various native um, amaranths. I I looked on Wikipedia. I'm not sure. I thought it was only native to this to the New World, and then it spread to the other parts of the world. I don't know if it also is native to other parts of the world. That is something I don't know enough about. Mm -hmm. I don't know enough about foraging ferns. There are only about four that can be foraged for fiddleheads. And I don't know enough. And um, also you shouldn't eat. Well, first of all, you might check to see whether or not you'll be allergic, but also be careful because you don't want to over harvest and do know what you're doing. Otherwise they can be really blah. <laughs> that was very descriptive. Thank you. Um, it's so why a little, I want a little bit of history actually about why you think people moved away from just gathering plants that are, you know, in the natural world. Um, I'm afraid for that. I will get on my soapbox about big agra. Oh, um, I honestly, I really think that. I really think that after World War II, as big chemical companies got bigger and proliferated and needed to be able to sell products, and I, it's a, to me, it's a, going to be a very political answer. And unfortunately, I, I think there's money to be made from processed food, and I, that's my short answer. Oh, okay. Thank you. I know it is. It's probably a lot more complex than a something we can delve into right now. Well, um, I'll go on my soapbox, and I'll, you'll never get me off. <laughs> um, that's okay. Thank you. Um, Lisa says, "Love the cat." I think that that's to Janice. <laughs> oh. yeah, my, um, cat, my cat is in the other room. So, do we have any final questions for Iris? This talk was fantastic. Jill says. <laughs> Okay, since I don't see any, I do want to just come back and say thank you. This has been amazing. I feel like um, 
there's a there's a lot to be said to 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 be hearing your knowledge of the things that we should be doing um, on a daily basis to you know be more in touch with the nature and you know healthy plants and everything. So I really appreciate you coming on tonight and teaching us all of this this all of it. Thank you. It's really been a pleasure. This is just it's my passion. It's my joy. So thank you for having me. Absolutely. And if you all want some more information about Iris and what she does, her website is a fountain of information, which I will send to you the link to you in the recap. And I'll send you the um, the handouts as well as um, you had a recipe for garlic mustard pesto. Yes. Yes. <laughs> well, that one I'm going to be making myself. So thank you, Iris. Thank you, everybody, for being here tonight. And I hope you have a wonderful evening. Bye, Terry. Thank you. <laughs>